Hello, I'm Yvonne Lau from the HHS Office for Human Research Protections. I'm going to talk about regulatory options for secondary research with private information and biospecimens. Note that this is the second webinar of a two-part series. We advise you to watch part one first to get familiarized with important basic concepts uh, on this topic before watching this part two. So in this part two webinar, uh, I'm going to concentrate on talking about the options for investigators planning to do secondary research. In part one, we covered basic concepts on what secondary research is, what identifiability means, and we talked about the options for doing research um, with non-identifiable, secondary research with non-identifiable materials as well as doing secondary research with identifiable private information and identifiable biospecimens. In this particular webinar, we'll concentrate on looking at these options from the investigator's perspective. So investigators who intend to reuse information or biospecimens collected from their own primary research in future secondary research. So in other words, if you're an investigator, you are going to be going, um, you're going to be doing a primary research where you interact and intervene with living individuals um, to collect their information for a proposed research. Now you're thinking that, you know what, um, you know, for this material that I'm collecting now, I might actually contemplate on doing future secondary research that may be beyond the scope of this, um, that is beyond the scope of this current research. So what do I do? Right, so you're planning, so for this first one, we're talking about planning to use or share non-identifiable materials with researchers to do secondary research. Please note that when you are doing your initial informed consent uh, process at the point of the primary research, um, there is a new requirement in that informed consent under 116B in the revised common rule. And this requirement is a notification that needs to be included to tell your um, research subjects um, whether or not you will be using their non-identifiable materials uh, potentially in future secondary research. All right, so this is some, it's a notification. Um, if you think that you're absolutely not gonna be using their material for future research, your notification would tell them that you're not. But in this particular situation, since we are contemplating on reusing, recycling, so to speak, this material, um, the notification will have to be telling your research subjects that this is a, uh, something that you contemplate on doing in the future. Other than that, that you need to pay attention to, um, the next thing we realize is, in fact, you know, secondary research with non-identifiable materials is not human subjects research, all right, and therefore does not need IRB review. All right, so I just want to repeat here, secondary research refers to research where you are using materials that are either collected for non-research purposes or for research other than the one that you're proposing. All right, this is secondary research. And when you do that with no identifiable uh, materials, in other words, information and biospecimens, you cannot link back to living individuals, right? Then this is not human subjects research and it does not require IRB review. So what if you plan to use or share materials with identifiers retained? Because in your future secondary research, you know, it, for some reasons, I think um, you, you think that retaining the identifiers would be important for you. So what if you want to do that? Well, the important thing is to anticipate and plan ahead. So now that you are you know, planning to go about doing your um, interaction and intervention primary research, you want to start anticipating that this is something that you want to do in the future, secondary research with identifiers retained. And in the informed consent form that you are giving to your subjects, um, you know, the, the study that you're doing now, you should actually consider how to appropriately describe in this informed consent 
the extent to which confidentiality of records identifying subjects will be maintained. Um, and you should do this when you are actually getting your informed consent for, the, for this um, first initial original study. So this is so that subjects will have a clear idea as to how this protection of their information will be undertaken um, and, and you know, especially in the case when you plan to use some of the materials with identifiers in the future. So this is just the baseline, right? And once you've done that, then here are the options that you can consider. So options for using or sharing information or biospecimens with identifiers retained for secondary research. Because this um, secondary research involved identifiable materials, anytime you have identifiable material, it's called human subjects research, right? And then your options will be either there may be exemptions that could work to your favor, or that it will have to be considered under um, non-exempt human subjects research requiring IRB review. So I'm going to go through these options. So for certain data, so certain data research, exemption four with a new expanded provision, the so-called HIPAA provision, may apply to you. So you could, under this, if you are an investigator, you know, under a HIPAA regulated entity and you propose to use this um, material with identifiers, um, you could potentially do this under exemption four, noting, of course, that HIPAA does not cover biospecimens. Um, I want to point out also that um, exemption four, provision one, which involves um, the use of publicly available identifiable material, um, you can do that too, since it's publicly available. There's no additional worry about privacy and confidentiality. Or the for the new fourth provision in the exemption four, which really is not commonly used in the not so commonly used in the general research community because it really involves just government work using information that is collected by the government. So I'm not going to go into that. So the most relevant one for you is the exemption four provision three, the so-called HIPAA provision. Another option is to obtain broad consent under the revised common rule for future secondary use when obtaining the initial standard informed consent. So here I just want to say broad consent, uh, when we refer to broad consent under the revised common rule, it's a new specific, unique um, term of art. And you know, to understand what it is, you should refer to um, our webinars or other resources that talk about broad consent. All right. The anticipation is that many people, when they are doing their initial you know, study and trial where they're interacting with subjects and getting their standard informed consent, that they would at the same time potentially you know, obtain their broad consent that would cover broad future secondary use. Your third option is to just obtain what we refer to as the standard informed consent uh, fulfilling all the requirements that are indicated in um, 46.116, all right? Now, we kind of think that um, could you actually get this standard informed consent for secondary, future secondary use at the time of the initial research? Potentially you could, but if you, you know, you need a lot of, you need enough specifics, you need to know enough specificity about your future secondary research to possibly be able to satisfy you know, the requirements that are required to be included in the standard informed consent form. One of the other opportunity is actually you know, researchers in the future, because they never really thought about using the um, materials with identifiers, but some, at some point in the future when they are actually really planning their secondary research, at that moment in time, uh, and they realize, oh, you know what? we would really like to be able to use this material with identifiers. So it could be the, uh, at that point in time that they choose to go back and um, ask subjects for, um, through the standard informed consent process and ask them for the informed consent for, their, for the use of this material. And the fourth option, which is um, commonly used in the research um, community at the moment, is for researchers to um, go to their IRB to obtain a waiver of informed consent so that uh, the materials can be used. And often 
um, you know, the, of course, the, all the conditions for waiver or alteration of informed consent um, need to be satisfied. And I just want to point out at this point here is that under the revised rule um, for the waiver of informed consent, the IRB needs to make an additional uh, uh, verification, and that is that um, identifiers are necessary for the research. The IRB needs to verify that, you know, really the researchers cannot do their research without the identifiers. So this is an additional condition that needs to be satisfied in the waiver of, of consent under the revised common rule. So let's turn to the other side. So you know um, out there in the research community, there are many investigators who actually never really you know, do the initial interaction and intervention with subjects to get their, their materials for research. So they never really do primary research. And all they actually do most of the time anyway is secondary research. Right? By this, it means that their entire research project only involves materials that are collected through a not for the purpose of um, uh, 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 research that is not the current one, or collected through non-research processes. So, like you know, just looking at clinical data or you know uh, tests samples that are uh, that remain after a clinical diagnostic test or treatment, and so on and so forth, uh, or material or information that are generally being collected for other purposes already. So, you know, there's a whole lot of researchers who actually. Only, who are only involved in conducting secondary research. So from their perspective, what do they need to know? So if they're seeking only non-identifiable materials, in other words, that the material could be coded, but as long as they cannot link back to living individuals who donated those materials, then we're saying that this is not human subjects research, and the common rule doesn't really apply to them. So this is what it is currently, and it's not changed under the uh, new revised common rule. So what happens if these researchers are seeking identifiable materials to work with for their secondary research? All right, so first of all, see if one of the exemptions can be used. Um, I've talked about exemption four already. So there are four, again, a reminder, there are four provisions in the exemption four under the revised rule, all right? Um, if you want to um, go through them, review part one of this um, set of webinars. So exemption four, if it's applicable, there's no IRB review needed, all right? Then there is pot potential for using exemption eight, all right? Exemption eight is a new exemption. It would have, op it would require having had broad, consa broad consent obtained you know, at some point in time. So there is broad consent from subjects. And again, broad consent is this new concept under the revised common rule. Um, it will, its use will require something called limited IRB review, where the IRB has confirmed, uh, verified, and confirmed that the conditions for this exemption have all been met. And just one last uh, reminder. If investigators choose to use this exemption eight and they satisfy the conditions, um, they also need to make sure that there is not a plan to res return research results um, uh, in, 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 the, in, in the plan of this research. So if, what about if none of the exemptions that we just talked about can be used? What can these investigators do? Well, if none of the exemptions work, then it will be will have to be done uh, under non-exempt human subjects research situation, which means that it will, it will require IRB review of some sort, um, and also that they will need to obtain a standard informed consent to do that. All right, go back to subjects and ask for informed consent in order, for, in order to be able to retain the identifiers. Or they can go back uh, to the IRB and request a waiver of informed consent. Again, I've mentioned that under the revised common rule, there is a new condition that the IRB needs to make sure that it's satisfied. And that new requirement is that um, the research um, requires the use of the identifiers. So identifiers are necessary for this research. They need to be able to show that. So this ends part two.
of this um, set of webinars on secondary research, use of identifiable um, of private information and biospecimens. Please refer to the text of the revised common rule available on OHRP's website for a complete and accurate description of the regulatory requirements. For this particular presentation, please review the regulations at sections 46.102E, which talks about identifiability, 46.104D, which are, talks about the exemptions, and 46.116, which talks about informed consent, including broad consent. So if you have any questions, do not hesitate to submit your questions by email to ohrp at hhs.gov. Please also check out the OHRP website at www.hhs.gov forward slash OHRP for resources on the revised common rule. Thank you for your attention, and we invite you to review other webinars on the revised common rule that OHRP has created to inform the research community. Thank you very much.